Hey everyone, so today is a big day as it's our first episode of how they started their tech career and we have our first guest who is a technical architect and a Microsoft certified trainer. He is also part of the Welsh Azure user group and I would like to welcome our first guest all the way from South Wales, UK is none other than Johnny Chips aka John Lynn. Hey John, how's it going? And yeah, take it away with a bit of an introduction for yourself. Yeah, hi Arishab. So yeah, thanks for having me on the show. So yeah, my name's John Lunn, uh, also known as Johnny Chips by my Twitter handle out in the social media space. Um, I currently work as a technical architect for a company called BT Enterprise uh, here in the UK. So BT was old British telecommunications. Um, so I find myself in the role of sort of cloud architect. So helping BT's customers over here in the UK kind of architect, evangelize and kind of move from that traditional on-prem um, infrastructure based kind of uh, scenario that a lot of companies are in at the moment into cloud technologies and cloud services. So yeah, I've been with BT probably about eight, eight years, just over eight years now, I think. Um, but yeah, that's what I do. So um, yeah, been doing uh, Azure predominantly focused uh, cloud architecture for pr probably around about four years now, I would say something like that. Um, but I worked in the 365 space, Microsoft again. Uh, I don't think I'm a Microsoft fanboy, but I just seem to work with Microsoft technologies more often than any other vendors. So, um, so yeah, really enjoying my time working with them at the moment. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. Eight years. Eh? So yeah. yeah, I would, I would love to know about like a bit of a background when you were younger. So like when you were, you were in your teens and how it kind of, like, did you had always an interest in IT or you kind of developed it as you grew? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's a while ago now for me. So, uh, without giving my age away, that's, that's a few decades ago for me now. So I guess growing up, um, I mean, I grew up when you had the things that, well, it was a BBC, um, microcomputers were introduced into schools. So I was probably about five or six when I first saw the turtle that you could drive around the floor and plot the, 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 the coordinates and draw a picture on the floor and things like that. And, you know, I think that was probably my earliest memory. So I would have been five or six. Um, I've got an older sister and I, I remember one year my parents bought her a Commodore 64 for Christmas I think and uh, I think she probably used it for about a month and then I took over um, and just it was mainly for as you do you know as a kid I was probably I guess eight nine years old maybe then and it was just playing games but then I, I quickly remember getting involved in uh, I used to love wrestling the WWF back in the day in the you know kind of, kind of late 80s uh, early 90s and I remember getting a little bit into buying the computer programming books and writing some basic code and things like that. And I remember writing a little um, application that kind of um, spelled out all the different wrestling matches that were going on and the winners and the losers and how long they lasted and things like that. So I remember doing that as, as, as a kid. Um, so yeah, I was, I was really interested in computers from, from an early age, but I think it was probably more of a hobby thing. Um, and I remember, I remember then the first step into the kind of x86 world of computing where my mum bought the first home PC and a friend came over from work to kind of build it with a big stack of floppy disks and, uh, and all that good stuff stuff and um so yeah i think i i grew up with it really had a great interest in computing never really saw at that stage that i could have a career in computing so i kind of um you know it was really i, I guess i was one of those people that would just dabble and play i remember getting my first copy of dreamweaver um you know back in the kind of mid to late 90s and having to play with html and building some web pages and and flash and making things move and stuff like that and i i go and build friends websites sites and things like that but again I was never really working in, in any kind of computer it was just more of a hobby thing so yeah they were probably the earliest memories I guess okay. um yeah, yeah so so I mean really interesting childhood you had and yeah I think, yeah I I didn't have any interest <laughs> in computers when I was younger like I I used to like open up things and stuff so yeah like, I would have toys and other like consoles at the time that I would open up and just mess them up and then try to figure out how to like uh, 
joined them. That rings a bell, yeah. I, I think, I, to be honest, I speak to a lot of people about their kind of early years. And I think the one common thing is that all my friends and colleagues just love to pull things apart and see how they worked. And I mean, I, I've done that. I, I remember once I pulled apart a tape deck and I think um, forgot to unplug it and electrocuted myself. Luckily, I'm here to tell the tale, but I remember that vivid leaning on a, on a, on a couple, couple of tunnels. So yeah, don't take things apart, kids, unless you know, know that you've unplugged them first. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just with the mentality, I guess, isn't it? With computers, you just like to know how things work. No, that is, that is great. Um, yeah, so... Tell me, like, how did you get your, or what was your first tech job? And like, how did you kind of end up in that? Or what was your experience trying to get the first job in tech? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I mean, well, I'll tell you a little bit about my education, really, from, from going through sort of in the UK, we, we go through sort of primary school into high school. Um, I never did anything specifically with computers in, in kind of like the, the high school, as we call it here in, in the UK. When I moved out into college, it was one of those things. I was one of those kids that just didn't know what, to, what, I, what I wanted to do in my life. I didn't know which direction I wanted to go. I played music. I played guitar, drums. Um, my sister was a singer. So naturally, my parents were saying, hey, you've got to go to college. You've got to go and do something. You can't just, you know, sit around and do nothing. So I ended up um, signing up for a performing arts course where I went to do and I studied music for for two years so music and music production and recording techniques all of that kind of stuff and and I was playing in band I was playing music so I had the belief that I was going to become an internationally famous you know world touring rock star at one point in my life you know and you can imagine parents back then they were like yeah okay John but you, you kind of need a backup plan you kind of need to make some money and get a job <laughs> so I think after I did that, I, I came out of college. It was my mum turned around and said, well, look, John, you, you kind of want to start earning money now. You you can go to university if you like, because I mean, I guess in the UK back then, that was the traditional thing that you break out, go and do some university degree. I, I just didn't have a clue. I did not know what I wanted to do. So I ended up getting a job at a local firm, um, doing some data inputting work. You know, it was literally, they made four clicks forklifts and excavators and you know all those great things that you see so I ended up doing a bit of data entry and it was you know it was for a, an aftermarket department where we sold spare parts and and I guess when I got into the world of the office space I was always seen as that that person that dabbled with the computers you know I could un, I could unjam the printer and I could change a toner cartridge without spilling it all over myself and you know I, I was just the one that would 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 tinker with things in the back end uh you know of systems and, and I could type a bit quicker than everybody else so I naturally got given a lot more of the IT kind of computer tasks. So um, that transitioned, I moved into another company, again, not in the tech role, but moved into, again, it was like a customer services focused contracting area where, again, I was dealing with the day-to-day -day applications, but I was kind of fixing those applications as well as doing my job. So it got to the point after, I, I must have been probably... Um, yeah, it probably would have been early 20s was when I first got my, my first proper job in tech. And that was literally, um, I, I decided probably around about 24, 23, 24 years of age that, look, I want to get a job in tech back then. And we're talking, you know, I won't give my age away, but it's, it's probably not far off 20 years ago now. Uh, the kind of way that you got into tech back then was you kind of needed some form of university education. And, and I always said, you know, whether it was arrogance or just confidence, I always said, I, I could get a degree if I wanted one. It's just I didn't know what I wanted to do. So a couple of my friends turned around and said, well, well, go on, then go and get your degree and then you can look for a job in tech. And anyway, from there, I, I reached out. So I don't know if what you guys have over in the US, but in the UK for kind of remote learning, we have this thing called Open University. Um, where it's it's you know it's prevalent everywhere now in these days but back then open university was one of those things that was seen to be for the mature students for adults looking to relearn something so I ended up doing open university from about 2004 and the company I was working for saw I was doing that and I was doing it in in IT I was doing a computer science degree at the time and I was you know um, and I need to get a job in tech. So I turned around and I said, look, is there any chance that I can get a job in the IT department, the firm I was working at? Oh. And they said, 
they said, okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. We'll we'll work something out. So that's what happened. So I ended up moving into tech, working in a very small IT support capacity for um for a firm that was probably it was probably around about 500 staff. It had global offices, so it had office offices, a couple in the UK, it had one in Australia, um, one in China. So it was kind of like you had that, it was a small company, but it had a global reach. So yeah, so and my boss at the time then knew I was doing open university, and it was a little bit of a jackpot. He turned around and said, "John, I know that you're studying, so it's it's quite expensive, as as I'm sure everybody's aware with with that kind of education." He turned around and he said, "John, um, you know, do you want me to see if the company will fund that for you?" So I was like, "Well, yes, please, okay." So and that's what happened, and it was it was one of those things then. But because the company was funding my degree, and I was working in IT, I felt. That the not not the pressure, but obliged. Well, I've got to kind of see this through because it's not just for me now. It's the company are funding me, so I did that. And I think I did Open University for about it was part time courses. So I think I spent about four or five years doing the degree part time and got the degree. Uh, and in that kind of four or five years, I you can imagine I was literally turning my hand to everything. So I was very much a generalist in terms of you know I knew. Uh, everything that I could possibly learn about the Microsoft stack, so Active Directory, Exchange, you know, file servers, print servers, all the general office type end applications, I guess. Um, a lot about uh, enterprise resource planning, so ERP, it was a manufacturing firm. So I was dealing with, you know, um, big HP UX systems with, um, you know, I think it's yes, HP UX Unix yep. system, a, a platform called Visibility, off onto an Oracle database, really big coming out of the monolith type servers, um, telephones, you know, li literally from wiring a telephone to plugging it in. And it was no software defined mappings or anything. It was literally get your crib tool out, plug it in the wall and, you know, re remap your telephone, your digital telephone, which was a new thing back then, you know, and uh, and it was, it was before voice over IP and all that good stuff. So I, I kind of learned that through the trenches, I guess, everything, anything with a plug was was the whole joke. If you had a plug on it, it was the property, you know, that was the IT department that somehow had to fix it if it went wrong. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was a great grounding. So at that time, sort of um, early, like I say, 2004, um, for about five or six years, while, whilst I was doing the degree, I was learning a lot of cool stuff about business technology and business tech and, you know, applications and servers. And we were a relatively small IT team. So, you know, we were supporting all the users. So the endpoints, the the devices, the laptops, PCs, all that good stuff through to the telephone system, through the storage, the networks, the WANs, the LAN. We kind of had it all. And it was almost like we just had to make everything work in the best way that we possibly could. So, um, yeah, I, I that's what I did my first job in tech. And um, yeah, I completed the degree. Um, they stood me up on a platform and well done, John, the company sponsored you, you've done your degree now. And I took the opportunity to to kind of keep that wave going. I, and I turned around to my boss and said, um, do you think they'll sponsor me to do my master's? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he went and asked and he said, yeah, they will. And I was like, oh, <laughs> do, I, do I want to do it? That, that's... So I did start. So I started to do my postgraduate um, qualifications then which look I think at the time uh, it was seen for me that um, you know computer science degree is one thing hands-on learning and the real world uh, training that I had was a completely different thing and I look back in hindsight and I do still value the both equally the same because I because you see a lot now that you don't need a computer science degree to become you know a developer or absolutely you don't but I think the things that you learn from doing any degree, not just a computer science degree, but I think the thing that that instilled in me was doing a degree teaches you how to learn. You know, I think that is the key skill that I got out of doing that degree because you have to be disciplined. You have to keep on track with deadlines and, you know, uh, project work and, and, and assessments and exams. Whether you agree or disagree with that, I don't think is the point. I think the context and the, the course, I learned a lot of good skills doing the actual the coursework and the the the, the content of the course. I, I learned how to program. You know, one of the a couple of the modules were programming. Yep. I learned how to do a bit of pro, uh, project management because so I had to do some courses. So the content of the course is one thing, and I definitely learned skills. But I think just the whole regime of that university. 
um, education instilled those other kind of softer disciplines in how to manage your time and things like that. But okay. equally, you know, the real world, getting in, rolling your sleeves up and doing all of that kind of real world um, stuff is, is you know, that, you know, that speaks no end. You, you just got to get in and get on with the technology. So, yeah, I went on a bit there, Rashid, uh, Rashid but yeah, that's my kind of pot, potted history of my, uh, my early career, if that makes sense really interesting and yeah i think you mentioned a really good point is like you need to have the skill especially in tech to like you, you should know how to learn uh, things yourself because it's it's mm -hmm. changing so frequently and so rapidly that if you, mm -hmm. if you don't know how to learn new things you'll you'll be left out no doubt and yeah yeah, yeah. No, you also, like, I, I get it. Like the university degree teaches you the technical skills you need to enter the field. And I agree, like in the older days, you needed like a formal education. Did you just say the olden days, Emery Sharp? <laughs> I did. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. I remember, I, remember yeah. I think it's still the same uh, coming from India. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did like went to university and I did like my a year and a half. And that's when I decided to drop out and move to Canada. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do agree. Like, not in the olden days too, but still, like in India, you you still need to have a bachelor's like a bachelor's degree to get into yeah. IT, software engineering, or software development roles. Um, it's mm -hmm. changing, but it's still slow. Uh, being like third world yeah. country. I, yeah, I, I think I completely I agree with those that say you don't need it. But I think what you what I found on my observations on those people that say you absolutely don't need a computer science degree. I think my observations are that those people that say that generally are quite driven and passionate people anyway. So absolutely, you don't need that computer science degree because you've kind of got that drive and that passion and that desire to want to get on and do things, which look to some people you can't teach that to people you've, you've got to have that desire and that passion whereas i think for, for i would say that the mere mortals the people that maybe don't spend a lot of time on social media and you know a kind of quite uh, extrovert in that sense i think for those people they're kind of we, we don't know who they are because they're not on social media they're sat behind the scenes not not sharing their thoughts and feelings to the world you know yeah. they, they that's and that's what i mean for the mere mortals you know i don't mean that in any disingenuous or disrespectful way but those people that are you know maybe for whatever reason just don't engage with the social platforms obviously they're they're, they're uh, you know what do they see are they they completely you know unaware that there is another way to go around these things, which, um, you know, I think, which is where things like computer science and certainly university education, you know, is there, but I do, I do agree. You know, I think both, both views are very valid for very different reasons, if that makes sense. So I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no to one or the other. And, um, you know, I think everybody's got their own view and, and, and way of creating their own kind of um, momentum to get into the industry and keep up with all the learning and, and, and actually find their own way through there. So, um, yeah. 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 And, and like whatever works for an individual person, like for me, it didn't work at the time. So I dropped out, but now, yeah. in, as you said, like the open university, and that's what I'm doing right now is um, getting my computer science through uh, one of those platforms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it, it totally depends on what works for you. And yeah, it is like, I, I agree. Like university teaches you like all these other important skills that you need in life, mm -hmm. um, like discipline, um, how to learn yourself and other soft skills that might be necessary in like real world. So yeah, uh, moving on. Um, so that, that was really impressive. Uh, it's great to learn about like how you kind of started your tech career. And yeah. What would you say like what's like one great thing uh, that you think is like awesome about tech? I think the the biggest thing for me about tech is that um, you can make it whatever you want to make it based on how much energy and passion and creative creativity that you've got within your mind you can use tech 
to solve so many different things or you know literally from something as simple as you know alerting you to an email or you know some social media notification right the way through to solving huge you know humanitarian problems you know and you know don't get me wrong <laughs> not everybody's going to reach those um you know goliath you know sort of and win some kind of nobel Pre peace prize for something that you do with tech but the point is that it, that that is there for everybody that that it is possible it's just about it's about you know you pitting your own um desire passion in, in uh, intelligence and creativity to solve real world problems and i think certainly the the amount of um the, the amount of barriers that have kind of been breached now with entry to tech and using tech over the late the last decade um has proven that to be so you know a lot of the time so yeah it's just just that excitement just the the the, the possibilities i guess is, is the biggest thing that excites me with tech at the minute awesome awesome and what would you say is like one bad thing or like a bad experience that you had in tech I, I don't know if it was a bad experience. Um, I, I would say just generally the thing about tech is that if you're a naturally passionate person, then you probably find staying up to date and stay on top of latest things um, relatively easy. And I think you hear a lot of people talking about the whole work-life balance and look there's this element of learning we've all got to do. And I think the, the bad thing is as much as we all try and you know say look we've got to stay on top we've obviously got other things going on we've got work we've got family we've got you know some of us have got kids and other pressures outside of the working environment so time management is a thing and i think i think at the moment the bad thing about tech um whether we choose to ignore it or not i i think is still there is because the the amount of the, the sheer overwhelmingness of all the different possibilities and things that you could do unless you've got you know if you're coming into the industry with a completely open mind you're new into tech then you know you find this meandering pathway but i think once you've been in the industry for a long time trying to match which pathway you where do you want to go is becoming increasingly difficult because there are just so many ways and there's so much expectation for people to kind of know what they're doing you know certainly from business you know at the end of the day we most of us work in tech um because we've got a job and it pays the bills you know and i think so the the sheer overwhelming stuff the, the the amount of things that we can do with tech the amount of things that we can learn i think will infiltrate that kind of work-life balance mm -hmm. to a certain extent and that's difficult i i think that's a difficult and not a great thing about tech at the moment although you know it does come down to how you handle that you know and, and it's just recognizing you know if you are doing too much if you are kind of burning out just with the sheer overwhelming nature of there's always something to learn um recognize it and do something about it you know so take a step back take a breather things are going to be there if you leave it a day a week a month you don't have to run at it at 100 mile an hour constantly which like i said i've spoken to a number of great people across the community in the same spaces that we we talk about rishab and you know you can see that there are people that have struggled with this i struggled with it on times you know even before i started doing some of this public faces stuff, just to keep up with the expectations with work i think that is the probably the for me the, the worst thing about tech is staying on top staying at the top of your game um can be difficult and can be overwhelming if you don't keep it in check and and recognize some of the uh the points of um you know what it what it can do to you if that makes sense no, for sure. Yeah, I agree. And I have been at a point, like, in different times uh, where it, it gets overwhelming if you're, like, trying mm -hmm. to keep up with everything that's going on. Like, you need to yeah, sure. pick your kind of niche and, like, mm -hmm. drill down what you really want and, like, just focus on that. Otherwise, it's, like, it's really hard to manage your time. Um, and yeah, no, I agree. Like, you, you definitely need... To step back and see where you're going in the long run. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. The most, um, but yeah, no, I agree. Uh, so yeah, that's that is some great advice, even with like the bad experiences we have had in tech. Um, yeah. So what what are you excited about, like with the future that's coming beyond us, uh, with all these uh, new technologies and 
uh, either it be AI or like decentralization is taking away. Um, so yeah, what are you excited about? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, to be honest, uh, I, I think I'm one of those people that that gets uber passionate about something. Um, I'm I'm like a kid in a sweet shop sometimes. You know, when you see technology, I I do have, you know, I recognise that sometimes the passion that I ex- exert for technology, you know, especially in in more in work as well, is I suppose it can. Uh, <laughs> I'll say it nicely. It can probably rub people up the wrong way, but I just get so involved with with just the excitement of what's coming and, and what you can see coming. I suppose, you know, growing up through the eighties and the nineties, you see all the, the great films, and, you, and I remember all the great films about what's the future going to look like. And you know, you can see, for me, it just feels like my childhood is becoming a reality at the moment. You know, certainly with lots of the tech advances that are going on, and so I don't know whether it's just that play on. Um, you know, I grew up, you know, I, I suppose I'm, one of, I'm that generation that I grew up before the tech was there. You know, mm-hmm. obviously technology has been around in whatever form you want to call it that for years. But certainly now when we're reaching this this age of, you know, effectively what we're, we're, we're trying to call the, the, the fifth industrial revolution with cloud technologies and the ubiquitous nature of technology and cloud and 5G and wireless technologies, for me, you know, things like IoT and, and AI, as you mentioned, um, in my mind at the minute that it's clear as day that is the opening to where we're going with uh, with all of our futures in in any industry that we work in whether it's things like retail or manufacturing or you know f- uh, financials any kind of industry healthcare you know the the, the iot the, the the space of sensors is so broad now and we've got the compute power and the compute scale in terms of physical form factors that you can make really small devices you can pop in a 5g sim and you can put these devices pretty much wherever you need to put them so we know that these devices and sensor information is going to be growing exponentially year on year from this point onwards and with that then comes the need for those solutions to actually do something meaningful with that data um and you know things like ai and ai powered streams of data into things like using machine learning to recognize patterns again it goes back to that point of i mentioned earlier just that with with your own sort of mindset and creativity and background and and an idea of the world how you can use these things now in a relatively inexpensive way to, to to build some kind of a solution that will address this and i think just purely because the amount of people that kind of starting to get get on board with these technologies over the last few years and even more so now people are learning these technologies i think give it five ten years ai machine learning you know internet of things and managing all those streams of data across things like 5g or 6g or whatever the the kind of data tech uh, the, the the networking technologies are the wireless networking technologies are of the future you know that's going to just be huge you know i think we're going to have well, we've got sensors everywhere now today, but arguably they're, they're probably not, not well. We know they're prevalent in terms of cameras and things like that, but uh, I can see it very, very much getting to the point where we, we won't be able to blink without it being recorded. Um, whether you agree or disagree with that is, is, is I suppose, not the argument I'm p- portraying, but I think, I think we will be at a point where every little thing that we do is going to be monitored, logged, recorded, uh, measured, whatever, in some capacity. You know, arguably, with social media and the way that algorithms are monitoring our social platforms at the moment, it's been going on a few years. Yeah. Um, you know, and under the radar to a lot of lay people that aren't necessarily working in tech. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, you know that the explosion of IoT devices and sensors and monitoring bits of hardware that we're going to start to see popping up in i guess the most unlikely of places um is is for me it's exciting because you can see i mean you've heard about elon musk talking about his is is i read it the, the chip that he embeds in the skull and, and i i had to reread that article the other day because i thought no surely not you know really <laughs> so you know you think is it the history and what we thought the future was going to look like driving these things yep. or is it the fact that there is a tangible benefit and a need to do it you know and, and somebody like elon Musk strikes me as that kind of character to say yeah, that's what he grew up with so uh, whether it's good or bad or the moral things i'm going to make a chip that's going to be implanted in your skull and you know people will just go really okay uh, yeah. what's that going to do for us i think it's called the neural link but you know it's just that whole thing of uh, you know don't get me wrong i see it in the positive mm-hmm. um the positive kind of manner 
that I, I guess we should see things in. Um, but equally, you know, you can't deny that there is obviously a, an undertone of, um, you know, sinister views on some of this technology. And I guess that's the battle that we may be having is how do we balance as a society that overarching cynicism of these technologies that we only employ them for the good and for the genuine good. And so with that comes, you know, lots of things and conversations, you know, pay grades well above our pay grades, you know, with yeah. political and socioeconomical kind of conversation that kind of has to happen. Yeah. But I think society needs to kind of step up and realize this is happening now. Mm. And and how do we all play a part to, to guide how this technology is actually going to be um, employed mm. in the future? So yeah, a long winded answer. Um, but I think I'm, I'm, in, you know, I, I feel a lot of passion for these technologies because of the good that they that can come from them. But equally, I'm, I'm very mindful of the bad that can be coming from things like this. So it's just how we how we find that balance. It's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting decade, I think, we've got to come. For sure. For sure. So yeah, uh, that, that was really interesting. And yeah, I agree, like, we are already seeing a lot of like a lot of rise in cameras, sensors everywhere. Like mm. you got one in your coffee machine now, in your f like fridges, and refrigerators, and stuff. So, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting time uh, for sure. <laughs> so yeah, now I'll be moving towards like the rapid fire round that I have <laughs> set up for you. Cool. Here. So yeah, yeah, uh, be ready and make sure like you answer them within five seconds. So the first Righto. one is. Um, what do you prefer, like Windows PC or like Mac? Uh, or I'm 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 definitely I'm definitely a Windows person. Okay, awesome. And like laptop or a PC guy? Uh, I, I, ooh, yeah, lap laptop in late in in more recent years, I would say laptop. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, what would you say is your favorite programming language? Favorite programmer, I, I suppose it's the one that I learned, which was C++. So, you know, it kind of led into object-orientated programming. But I, I, I'm not a programmer, but I've turned my hands to a few different languages now over the years. And um, like I keep telling everybody, I probably know enough to be dangerous. But yes, and any, any object-orientated language, I guess, is probably my comfort zone because it makes most sense to me. Sounds good. Uh, so rank the following technologies based on your your interests so like what do you think is where your interests are so the first is ai ml second being robotics and third uh decentralization slash like digital assets basically yeah so what just those think? three is yeah oh, ai yeah so in my interest i would have said ai and machine learning are probably at the top um what was the second one you said then? It was robotics, IoT. Robotics, yeah, probably robotics second. And I think um, de decentralization, so sort of uh, crypto and blockchain and things like that, I assume you're referring to there. Yeah, I, I've, I've read a bit about that, but I, I've, it's not one of those technologies that I've gone, uh, right, okay, I've got to get involved with that because I've got a cool idea that I want to use it for. But I see it and I think I get it mm -hmm. to a point, but it's yeah. certainly one of those technologies I, I've not, not done a lot of, um, my own research on so yeah i would have said ai and ml then robotics i mean god the the, the boston um the the company in boston uh is it boston dynamics isn't it have you seen that the robots that those guys have produced over the last wow yeah they've got a oh, yeah, check them out check out boston dynamics they've got a few cool robots they've got a little dog robot and a humanoid type robot that um yeah there's a few few cool uh youtube videos out there at the minute with the, the robots dancing and that but um and i had a chat with a guy called um simon shetty a few months back and he worked in uh, he worked for Lyft and uh, Tesla at one stage. So he's all about automated cars and robotics. He's a cool guy to, to reach out to as well. He's got some cool ideas and and, uh, and information. But yeah, anyway, long-winded answer again to quick fire round. Yeah, so yeah, those were the three questions that I had in my mind. And so you're almost at the end of the episode. And I would love to know, like, what would your a great advice or a tip would be for our audience here uh, who are trying to get into tech or are already in tech and trying to navigate their paths? 
Yeah, and I think, to be honest, my advice is advice that I've actually given to people coming into tech now within my workplace. And it's one of those things I wish somebody had given me the nudge years ago, but it comes down to community. I think, you know, you and I both know, Rishav, in, in terms of turning your hand to community, um, opens up so many doors, not just on a, you know, a networking perspective and you get to meet really cool people, but just that whole learning exercise and helping you formulate which direction you may want to go in tech. You know, there, there's so many cool people out there in, in the, on social media, you know, that's how we met Rishab. So um, I think turn your hand as much as you can or much as you can afford into investing it into the public facing side of tech, because like I say, there are so many brilliant people out there more than willing to help you find your own path. And, and there's so much great content that people are making and putting out back out into the world that if you try and do it without the social side, which look, that that's how I did it, you know, going, well, mainly because we didn't have social media when, when I was uh, learning tech for the first time, but you know, if somebody had said, yeah, John, you want to turn your hand to this, you know, which, you know, I wish I'd done it years ago because I met some absolutely brilliant people over the last uh, year or so now. And so, yeah, that would probably be my biggest bit of advice. Anybody starting off in tech, get involved in social media, get involved in the tech communities, and then everything else becomes that much easier is my, is my bit of advice. No, for sure. For sure. And yeah, we have some like great, great folks you know, in the tech community that have lived like their kind of few years of experience in tech and mm -hmm. they have great advice. Um, and as John said, like I met him uh, through Twitter and hundred days of cloud and Welsh Azure group. So yeah, no, we learn in public. It will definitely help you. And there are some great people that can help you with your path or journey that you're trying to find out. Oh, hundred so, yeah. percent. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that'll be an end to our episode. Uh, and yeah, would you like to, uh, where can people find you on social media? Uh, yeah, yeah. well, no, absolutely. Well, firstly, thanks for having me on, Rishab. It's been fun. It's been great. Obviously, it's always great at catching up with you. You know, it's great. The, the stuff you're doing over the other side of the pond, so to speak, is fantastic. Keep, keep it up. I've seen you doing some fab, fantastic things with uh, GPS and, you know, everything else and with um, Anais as well with the 100 Days of Kubernetes. So keep that up, matey. That's absolutely brilliant to see. But um, yeah. If anybody wants to follow me, um, my blog is on johnnychips.com and that's uh, Johnny Chips with a Z. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not going to spell it because just, just Google Johnny Chips and, and as you, you'll probably find me. So yeah, and I'm on YouTube as well with um, Cloud Talk with Johnny Chips. So I uh, put a few videos out now and again. So um, yeah, but reach out to me. I'm on Twitter under the same handle, Johnny Chips. Um, reach out, come say hello and uh, happy to have a, have a chat if you if you think I can help you in any way. Awesome. And yeah, I'll, I'll link all of your uh, links and uh, Twitter handle below in the description. But yeah, it was it was great having you, John. Uh, and yeah, it, it was a fun conversation. And there's definitely some interesting technology we're all excited about that's coming our way in the next decade. But yeah, we'll catch up with the audience in the second episode. So for now. Yeah. Thanks. No, no, thanks for having me. Nice to speak to you, Rishab. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, John.